Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast. It is the final aftermath pod of the 2023 season, and it comes after just 17 games. Patriots wind up 4-13. and 13. There will be no playoffs, as you know. And as we look back at this game and this season, I keep coming back to March. Bill Belichick asked at the owners' meetings why Patriots fans should have optimism heading into the season. Belichick said, the past 25 years. Here, nine months later, after a 4-13 and season, all causes for optimism dashed. Here was Bill Belichick at the podium after a loss to the Jets. Disappointing um, finish there today. Um, have a lot of respect for the way the players competed, have all year. Um, you know, I thought that was a, you know, comp- uh, indicative of the competitiveness. You know, at the end, you know, it's a disappointing year for all of us, um, players, coaches, staff, entire organization, um, and not not anything that any of us are in any way content with. So, um, but it is what it is. So, um, I'll address some questions on the game. Um, as far as the future goes, I'll sit down with Robert as I do every year at some point at the end of the season. And, you know, we'll talk about things as we always do. I'm sure that'll happen. You couldn't help but detect a little bit of emotion for Belichick. And you can't blame the king of stoicism for perhaps cracking a little bit after 24 years running a team to a level that will be unmatched in any professional sport, as far as I'm concerned, by any coach. The Celtics didn't do it. The Canadians didn't do it. The Patriots are the only team that reached the level they did without pause from 2001 to 2018 with six titles, nine appearances in what I consider to be the most difficult of all sports to have continued success because there's more players in the NFL than anywhere. And we can credit the players and the Gronkowskis and the Slaters and the McCordys and the Edelmans and the Brewskis and the Johnsons and the McGinnis and the Malloys and, of course, the Bradys. And we can credit the coaches. You have to. The Dante Scarnecchi is as much as the Romeo Cornells, the Josh McDaniels, the Matt Patricias. And you have to credit the personnel guys, the Pioli's and the Casarios. But the tone setter was Bill Belichick. It's important to remember, however, that Robert Kraft begat Bill, and Bill begat Tom Brady. So the three of them were a three-headed monster that, without the other, really couldn't have existed. Okay, it was a trike that wouldn't have worked as well as a bike. Those three wheels had to be in concert. And as we reflect on whether or not the Krafts remain loyal to the decision that they made much earlier this season as the Patriots spiraled to a 2-10 and 10 team, it's important to remember, as people have continued to say, what would make the Crafts change their mind? And certainly until any decision is ultimately made, you can walk away from it. You can change your mind. As Bill Parcells famously once said, I reserve the right to change my mind. But to believe the Crafts would, would be ignorant of all the things that Robert Kraft has stated for the past four seasons, publicly and privately. Why was this likely the last game Bill Belichick coached for the New England Patriots? Because the reset in 2020 post-Brady was marred by the fact that Brady went and won a Super Bowl elsewhere. When Kraft was led to believe by Belichick that the sand was out of Tom's hourglass. That was the biggest sin. To have him in front of you and to not realize that he was that good. And that is as far as Robert Kraft was concerned. So they do a 2020 reset and they save their money. And after they spend $172 million in guaranteed money, Robert Kraft said, It's like investing in the stock market. You take advantage of corrections and inefficiencies in the market when you can. And that's what we did here. We'll see. Nothing is guaranteed. And I'm very cognizant of that. We're not in the business to be in business. We're in business to win. I remember we always made fun of the teams that spent a lot of fun in the offseason. 
So we know nothing is guaranteed, and I'm very cognizant of that. The team goes out, though, and wins 10 games. They seem to have hit on some of the free agents they signed, specifically Matthew Judon and Hunter Henry. And more importantly, the drafts, which Robert Kraft had lamented publicly in previous years, yielded something. Here's what Kraft said about the drafts. If you want to have a good, consistent, winning football team, you can't do it in free agency. This was in March of 2021. You have to do it through the draft. I don't feel we've done the greatest job the last few years, and I really hope, and I believe, I've seen a different approach this year. That approach yielded Mac Jones and Christian Barmore and a 10-7 and seven season and a player who was runner-up for Offensive Rookie of the Year. It appeared a Brady replacement had been found. But by the next March, again at the owners' meetings, a Patriots team was replacing Josh McDaniels. And Robert Kraft said, after the Patriots had failed to win a playoff game the previous season, I'm a Patriot fan big time. More than anything, it bothers me that we haven't been able to win a playoff game in the last three years. I'm happy that I think we had a great draft last year. That made up for what happened the previous four years or so. And I look forward to hopefully having a great draft this year. It's the only way you can build your team for the long term and consistently that you have a chance of winning is having a good draft. Kraft also added he expected the Patriots to be contenders as soon as this year. Well, last year they were not contenders. They did not win a playoff game. It stretched to four years. Additionally, not only did they not have a great draft in 2022 at all, several players already off the team. The players that looked great in 2021, especially Mac Jones, got Worse, much worse, because of decisions made with the coaching staff. Now, we have plenty of pushback that, hey, it's Mac, not Matt. Why didn't Bill O'Brien do better? And this is what Robert Kraft thought about the decision to put Matt Patricia in charge of the offense last year. He said he's a very good guy. This again, March 2023. An engineer, he works hard, and I think he got put in a difficult position. I think it was sort of an experiment, and he worked very hard at it. In retrospect, I don't think it was the right thing. And I feel bad for him because he's such a hard worker. He got put in a difficult position. Boom, you're putting it in Bill's court. How many times did he have to do that? That's why it's hard for me to understand why anyone would be grasping about for some kind of evidence that Robert Kraft was moving on. Additionally, he once more poked at the team's drafting and free agents, saying, we had a little period where we didn't draft as well a few years ago. We were able to get that changed, and I think we're doing better. Two or three years ago, I think we spent more cash than any team, and it didn't get the value we hoped. He concluded saying this about Bill Belichick in March. In the end, this is a business. You either execute and win or you don't. That's where we're at. We're in a transition phase. I still believe in Bill. I'd like him to break. Don Shula's record, but I'm not looking for any of our players to get great stats. We're about winning and doing whatever we can to win. That's what our focus is now. It's very important to me that we make the playoffs. This is in March of 2023. That's what I hope happens next year. It didn't happen. In 2023, the season closed in January of 2024 on a snowy, miserable, quiet day in Foxborough. We'll find out when the news becomes official. But for a look at what the atmosphere was like at Gillette Stadium on this Sunday, we're going to bring in Phil Perry. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there he is, fresh off the front lines in the Battle of Belichick, 2023, 2024. Phil, what was the atmosphere like in the stadium first during the game? I thought uh, it was muted. I'll tell you what I expected. I expected if you were here at this game, that you were here to say goodbye and thank you to Bill Belichick. Really the only reason. The weather stinks. The driving was bad. The team obviously isn't good. But you might come because it was Bill's last game. And you could get in the stadium for the low, low price of $20 or maybe even less by the time kickoff rolled around. And I would say the crowd was fine in terms of numbers. It was about what I expected, I guess but we never really got the moment that I thought we were going to get in terms of 
saying something, communicating something to Bill Belichick. Did the day got, just not lend itself to it? Maybe the weather had a lot to do with that, Tom. And the game maybe, situation? Maybe the game situation had a lot to do with that. But again, who cares about the game? I I, I thought if you were here, you you weren't here for the game. <laughs> but you were here for Bill. So you'd give like, uh, you know, a, a completely um, incongruous cheer. You fail on fourth and one. The Patriots fail on fourth and one. Doesn't matter. You just start a Bill chant and somehow everybody gets At up. At some was, point. There yeah, was no like stadium coming back board. from a TV any, timeout. You know, thank you, Bill. Nothing on the board. They take they, they didn't focus in on him at all. I don't not that I could see. Uh, and even when he was coming off, you know, he he took the quick route back behind the Patriots bench as opposed to going towards the tunnel. But that's what he always does. Goes back behind the Patriots bench to go down in the tunnel that way. And, you know, you had a, a smattering of fans sort of shouting in his direction. Hey, Bill, Bill. And, you know. As usual. I would say no acknowledgement from Bill, no wave. No, I don't think so much as a glance even in their direction. And our cameraman, Glenn Gleason, I know uh, was right there and got good video of it. So I'm interested to see it later. But I was on the field for that purpose to see how that thing was going to end. And, and I certainly didn't see him acknowledge the crowd in one way or another. So I thought that was going to be one of the big storylines of the event here today. Not obviously the game on the field, but of the event here at Gillette Stadium. And it was... Not there. That moment that I was expecting never happened. Yep. In Bill's post game, let's talk about that atmosphere just a little bit. Bill began by saying he would not address his future and that he would be meeting with Robert Kraft uh, down the road. Since it's our job not to allow the subjects, whether it be a town official, a president, or a football head coach, to dictate the rules of engagement in a media session. It behooves us to ask anyway. Dan Shaughnessy did, and so did you, Phil. Here's some of the back and forth with Bill on anything indicating whether or not he'd like to return. Do you expect to be coaching the team here next year? It's disappointing the way the game finished, yeah. Bill, is it your preference to come back next season and coach the team? Yeah, so I just finished the game here with the Jets, put everything I had into it, and I'm disappointed in the results. Our understanding that you're under contract for next year is it is it your hope to come back and I just and finished the game with the Jets, Phil. It was a very I you know, put everything I had into it this week and try to prepare our team the best I could to play in it. What was the press conference atmosphere like, Phil? A little funereal. I think that means I, sad. I didn't really get that. Um, I do think Bill Belichick. There was there was more emotion in his voice today than usual. He obviously was under the weather too. Um, so that impacts, I think, the the overall messaging and the tone and tenor of it. Um, but I would say he was even more patient, if that's the right word, with my questions yeah. than I thought he would be, right? He, yeah, he, he said he, he wasn't going to talk. Your, yeah, he hates your guts at this point. He, he could have said, Phil, I, I, I said I'm not going to talk about that. I, and he didn't say that. He said, you know, we're disappointed in the result. And, you know, he he didn't answer the question either, but he could have very easily shot them down. Um, so I don't know. I'm just really interested to see what tomorrow brings. We're, we're scheduled to talk with him on Zoom at 730. Mm -hmm. My guess is that's before uh, the meeting that Mike Reese reported was on the books for Monday a few days the ago. Bill, now, obviously, they could move that up and they could make the it tonight. Bill confirmed, right too. I thought that was interesting. Bill confirmed the day as well. I yes. thought Monday might be kind of consumed by exit interviews, and it would be Tuesday until Reese reported that it would be tomorrow. But um, what yeah, did you I think of his press conference? You you got a chance to you know hear yeah, him, yeah, digesting it from the studio uh, via television. I thought that it was somber. I thought that there was a tinge of sadness as he spoke about his personal disappointment and the team disappointment. And as I began this pod, Phil, talking about what bill said in march when asked why patriots fans had reason to be optimistic and bill said the past 25 years and just seeing now a four and 13 13 team leaving the field as 17 three losers to a hated rival just a sloppy gross performance led by a backup quarterback who's been the starter for like six weeks because the chosen franchise quarterback was literally unusable. It's just a, 
it's a shitty ending. And I think that Bill long ago knew that, but it's just such a come down. And, and I don't think anyone ever expected it to happen this way. I thought we all understood Bill's floor to be so much higher. A bad season for Bill would be six or seven wins at worst. So to see it before, and quite possibly, you know, people have thought, well, they got a couple breaks here. They'd be a 10-win team. They could be winless. Do you understand that? They could be winless. Hit the Hail Mary against the Bills. Excuse me, against the Jets. The Jets hit that. There goes that win. They don't come back against the Bills. There goes that win. They don't get a freebie touchdown handed to them by the, the Denver Broncos. There goes that win. I'll give them Pittsburgh. They could be one in 16. One in 16. Oh, okay. Gee. John, you're, you're bleeping all those because we have a very young audience. We do. I know you are. But you're right. Yes, you're right. And, and Tom, didn't this game in particular, didn't this game in a number of different ways sort of show how far the team has fallen? You sure. lost to Trevor Simeon in the Jets. You lost in a weather game when you used to beat the bag out of teams when you were at home and the weather was what it was today. It just used to just used to run over. Didn't matter and, if you didn't have Gronk. It didn't matter if you didn't have Jabal Sheard. I'm trying to think of an edge rusher. That's the first one that came to mind. He might have been here today. They had uh didn't matter if you all didn't have sorts of alumni here. here. Brandon King was here today. Jabal Sheard might have been back. Who knows? Were they here for Bill? I or honestly Matt. don't know. I Probably think they were, Matthew. I think they were here more for Slater. Yeah, James White was in the house. Um, Malcolm Butler was in the house. It, it did feel like this gets back a little bit to your question about just the atmosphere in the building. Being in the locker room after the fact, I think in part because everyone has a really good idea that this is Matthew Slater's last game. It was more about Slater after the game than it was Bill. Mm -hmm. And that might be because Bill would never acknowledge to his players that this could be it for him. Or because Whereas they're the, co-workers. That's the thing is they're co-workers. Like you have more of an identification with those. That's that's upper reaches management stuff. Yeah. Good point by you. I want to ask you this. Why um, why was Mac Jones the third quarterback today? Um, I theorized in the pregame on Twitter just saying, well, maybe they're just trying to protect the asset. Just casting, you know, about trying to find some kind of a reason because he's certainly – a better asset than Bailey Zappi, who threw for 88 yards. And one praise that he's better than Nathan Rourke. Why? Well, and you assume that he's a very likely trade candidate this offseason, yeah. right? So I was like, okay, you put him, keep him out of harm's way just in case. I think that is a completely logical theory on your part, although it would indicate that Bill Belichick's thinking about the future of this team. <laughs> And I'm not sure there were that many decisions made in this game that uh, would follow suit. You know, Jonathan Jones has been playing through stuff all year. He's out there late in this game. And Christian Barmore is playing through this game. And he's he's maybe their best asset, period. Not that they're about to deal him, but he's he's their best player. And he dealt with a knee injury. And I saw him get up slow a few times today. He had 10 tackles. That guy is just a, a menace out there. He, what a season for him. But, you know, they to vie too. I hope he's not hurt. He deserves to have a nice, relaxing January. Agreed. Agreed. So he's not managing those assets. He's not thinking about the future with, with those guys necessarily. So why with Mac? And Tom, I wonder, just understanding how that relationship has gone between Mac Jones and Bill Belichick over the course of the last couple of years, I, I do wonder, it is in the back of my mind, if this was one final way Take to try to – one final way to try to embarrass him. You get along with Mac. You've spoken. I've seen you speaking many times to him off to the side. What's your sense of where Mac is? Have you had any conversations that you can share or comments that you've gleaned from Mac that would help to, to indicate where things are with him as he obviously enters a crossroads with this team? Yeah, I've, I've uh, had a chance to speak with him a few times over the course of the last few weeks. I, I think he's in a good place mentally. Um, he's indicated that. I think he's comfortable with whatever comes next for him in terms of what the team decides to do with him. He is under contract, so he understands he can only do so much in terms of determining his future. Um, but 
it's my understanding based on conversations I've had with him, but honestly, more so, Tom, based on conversations I've had with with his teammates, they have really appreciated how he's handled the situation. Um, you know, I've had a couple teammates suggest to me that other players probably could have handled it in a much more disruptive fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he is still one of the first in the building in the morning. Dietrich Wise was telling me the other day, uh, Jeremiah Farms is number one in the building every day, believe it or not. Jeremiah Farms is the first Jeremiah guy. Jeremiah Farms is number one. Dietrich Farmers, Wise, farmers Dietrich don't Wise is, farmers rise early. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. That was good. That makes up for all the F-bombs you had earlier. Um, just wholesome comedy. Uh Dietrich Wise is in there early and Mac Jones is in there early. Those are those are three of the first people in the building um on a daily basis. And and my understanding is too, Tom, that the lines of communication between him and Bailey Zappi, him and Bill O'Brien are pretty good. With Bill Belichick, I don't think that exists to the same degree, if at all. So I I do again, I'll just reiterate. What we saw in terms of 90 minutes before kickoff, Mac Jones being named the third emergency quarterback behind Nathan Rourke and Bill Belichick when given the opportunity to explain his decision, basically saying that Nathan Rourke earned the backup role, i.e. he was better than Mac in practice to be the number two. That's maybe one final. Yeah. Not kick. No. Talk to you never, kid. Evan, Evan Lazar, I believe it was, had on Twitter that he spoke to Mac, and Mac said he wasn't surprised because it looked as if Nathan Rourke was getting more reps during the week. Again, Nathan Rourke's a CFL um, cast-off who was on the Jaguars practice squad who was brought in because Malik Cunningham was signed by the Ravens. He might have, He's kind of McSorley in, in that he's got no future here as a Patriots backup or third stringer most likely. Um, and he'd be at best a camp arm. So why would you give reps to Nathan Rourke and not Mac Jones, if not to say, you know what, in a different way, you piss me off just as much as Trent. Go over there. And that sucks. And that sucks in a way that as I, as I read some of the quotes from Robert Kraft this offseason about what a big fan he was of Mac Jones and how he felt that he was done a disservice by the coaching staff. How that's going to go play with ownership? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to make it as difficult as you possibly could on the kid who, eighteen months ago, you were saying had made dramatic offseason improvement from a brilliant rookie year, and now you're telling him to get a shine box and go sit over there. I mean, what are you doing? I would agree, and you know, I, not that it would, Tom. Not that it would impact the craft's decision making in in one way or another, but. If that's at all a window into how the the human interactions period have been behind the scenes, not only this year but in years past, you know, isn't isn't that something that you it might make the decision a little bit easier? It's not just the record; it's how people are handled. And yeah. do you have those skills anymore? Do you do you have the skills that are necessary in this day and age, especially to be able to get people to want to play for you and get the best out of them or all of them, all of, all of to, them to make all of them want to not just the peppers and the Andrews and the guys like Bailey Zappi, who you plucked from obscurity and put into positions to succeed. Those guys always want to play for bill. They always do. It's when the success is met and expectations are refracted back from the player on the coach and said, Hey, where's mine? Hey, give me some, I'll never forget it. I was told relative to Wes Welker, Bill loved him at $3 million a year, hated him at $12 million a year. Does not like players having an out. Jacoby Myers is another perfect example. So when you talk about relationships, it's not that Bill doesn't have the ability to relate to players. As we've heard player after player salute him this year, it's picking and choosing and sometimes saying, done with him. Everybody's entitled to do that. But why are you done with Mac Jones? Did you put him in a position that made him whatever? I'm not going to go into a whole friggin' Mac Jones thing. Well, I mean, listen, if you're Bill, you could 
jump in on the Zoom here with us and say, how many players are F-bombing my top assistants on the sidelines mid-game? So am I not within my rights to tell him to go scram in the final regular season game of both of our Patriots careers, potentially, you know, as you mentioned, you did it. If Trent Brown stops showing up to work and he's talking about joining other teams openly, can I not just sit him for no reason or, or, you know, list him. And I, he may honestly, Tom, he may be sick. We always have to leave that possibility, but listen, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, but why are guys doing, why are you getting sideways with Trent Brown and Mac Jones and Jack Jones and JC Jackson and however other many players we can, Real off. Um, and furthering that, there's another quarterback coming in, whether it be a veteran backup, whether it be a top three pick, whether it be a second rounder who has to be have the care and feeding done. And I've been told from the, you know, whether it be the highest reaches of the coaching staff or the highest reaches of the organization, Mac Jones is salvageable, but the doubt has been expressed that he is salvageable here. Because it was lamented, the lack of nurturing that he got, not just last year, but as a rookie. And you might say, oh, we got to nurture the guy. Well, I mean, a a little bit. You got to set some guys up to win. I thought that's what they were looking for here. Uh, It is is interesting. I don't know why I'm talking like this all of a sudden. It is. It's it's just so fascinating to me tom that we it comes that we are talking about mac jones here on on week 18 of the 2023 season because it really but it's but it's pertinent it is pertinent that relationship dissolving the way it dissolves him being on the sidelines and not on the field you know and i think there are some people in this story the storyline or this narrative has caught fire at various points over the last three years but you know how much did bill belichick want mac jones anyway it's my understanding. How much do that you think? Go ahead. It's my Thanks. understanding, you know, having, having asked that question of people this week, that Bill Belichick drafted Mac Jones. Robert you mean Kraft, people in Milton or high-ranking people? High-ranking people. People in the war room the night of the 2021 draft, the first round. So that, that was wasn't a, Robert Kraft pushing his ass out there on the front lines and saying, you got to take this kid. That was a unanimous decision from the football operations staff. One person told me, quote, Robert had nothing to do with it. That was a non-factor that the ownership, whatever ownership's opinion was at the time, I'm told was a non-factor. And Bill, listen, I will say this. I was told Bill wasn't necessarily all in on Mac Jones. He wasn't enamored by Mac Jones. He didn't love Mac Jones so much that he, wanted to trade up for him. Obviously mm-hmm. they sat there and he fell to them at 15, but he understood as other people in that room did. If we don't take our shot on a quarterback, we'll never hit on a quarterback. We're in quarterback purgatory. That was the word that was used in the conversation that I had with this source. When you're in quarterback purgatory, if you don't take your shots, you'll never hit. And so he was a shot. And what followed was a really good rookie year. Mm-hmm. But what followed from there was an inability to surround him with what he needed to succeed. And we saw what we saw, but that was Bill's pick. Was he in love with him? No, but did he want him at the time? Yes. I think and that you've got, he didn't follow through on it in year two to make it I know, work. I know you've got a lot of Intel on this topic because obviously folks, this isn't the only time Phil and I talk and he's going to be going into more depth on this topic as this week continues. And there will be a pod dedicated to it that I'm sure Phil will do in conjunction with any of the writing that he does when he's fully done reporting on that. So it's good shit. That's a preview of some of it. So Phil, I'd like to see that by Wednesday. Got it done. All right. Pretty Um, slow between now and then. So we got a lot of, we got a lot of stuff coming on down the line. It's Phil's got to get home, get showered up, get his feet in some nice warm socks. Um, And we got a busy day tomorrow and a busy day all week. So Listen, folks, we appreciate you being with us for the 54 regular season podcasts. God knows how many we did during training camp and in the off season, but we're probably at least a hundred in, in since last season ended. And uh, we appreciate you being with us. We will put a bow on everything Patriots as we go forward. I wrote a 4,400 word story on Bill and his tenure here. Whoa. Um, that took like the last three or four weeks. I was supposed to have it in December 1st. I finally finished it last night, but uh, be on the lookout for that. 
Love it. Bill, love you. Bye. Thank you. Love you too. Love you listeners. Bye.